Okay, the First Amendment chapter. We've been talking a little bit in the First Amendment about free exercise of religion. We've been talking a little bit about the Establishment Clause. And, and I mentioned to you that there are five basic freedoms that are protected in the First Amendment. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of petition or to petition the government for redress of grievances, and certainly the assembly, the right to assemble. Part of the First Amendment overall, when you think about it, is really the word expression. You are free to express your beliefs. You're free to express your values. And you can do this within the context, obviously, of your religion, your speech, the groups that you associate, the writings that you have, and frankly, the things that you petition the government for. One of the ways that people express themselves sometimes um, certainly could be political. It could be completely appropriate. It could be a protest regarding President Obama, for example. It could be a protest regarding former President Bush. These things would be acceptable. There are also, however, some things that are out there that would be considered obscene or obscenity. And what I wanted to do in this video is basically give you the test for obscenity. And there are three basic parts to this test. If something fails all three of these parts to this particular test, then it is obscene and it is not protected under the First Amendment's right to express yourself. It is not protected if it fails all three. If it meets one of these three, as few as one, it will be protected under the First Amendment and somebody can do or say these things. Now, this test that I'm giving you is actually known as the Miller test. And as I said, there's three prongs to this test. Prong one, the content in question, the material in question, must appeal to a prurient interest according to community standards. What does this mean? A prurient interest is a sexual, it's a lustful, it's a lascivious interest. So basically what we're saying is, is that this is going to be dealing with something that's going to be at least minimally risque. Probably more so though. And the other trick with this is, is that it is based on individual community standards. Now, if I'm filming today in D.C., outside of the, the nation's capital, a big metropolitan area, and, and a little bit further north than North Carolina, Let's say that North Carolina has got some fairly moderate views on what would be obscene. D.C., being further north, is probably going to have a little more liberal views on what would be viewed as obscene. And then the community standards in a place like New York City are probably going to be further still. And what I'm saying here is, the further that you go north, odds are the more community standards are going to allow more prurient or sexual type materials. In North Carolina, if it's moderate, if you go further south to say, I don't know, South Carolina, or you go further south to Alabama or Mississippi, well, you're probably going to have community standards that are going to be significantly more stringent, meaning less prurient interest, uh, prurient type material is going to be protected. Now, the second thing up here, it must display sexual conduct. It must display, and the key word is, offensive sexual conduct. Now, think about this, prurient interest, and sexual conduct according to community standards and it must be offensive. Well, what is offensive is going to be determined on what the community standards are. So I guess basically what we're saying here is that the Miller test is really allowing local communities to be able to, according to their own standards, determine what should be allowed and what shouldn't. And they're going to take into account that there are 50 different states, there are considerably more cities and counties and whatnot than states, so certainly when you think about it, they're going to be able to cater their community interest to what is actually allowed and maybe more importantly what's going to be banned. Typically, you can say that something appeals to a prurient interest. Typically, it's pretty easy to decide that sexual conduct, even offensive sexual conduct, is displayed. The catch-all, though, is the third one. Literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. The key thing, and really the big word on here, is that for something to be obscene, it must lack literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Think about this. You could demonstrate something that meets a prurient interest. You could demonstrate something that is an offensive sexual conduct. But if there is anything in there that's literary, artistic, political, or scientific, this now means that that material is not obscene. In fact, it's going to be protected under the First Amendment. Now, let me give you an example. And I want you to think about this. I need to be a little bit careful. How many of you have really watched a pornographic film? Not necessarily the whole thing, maybe just the good parts, maybe just some parts, it doesn't really matter. But the bottom line is, how many of you have really watched a pornographic film? 
Now, this is going to sound silly, but think about it. Is it just sex? Well, no. There's typically, from what I hear, mind you, there's typically kind of a cheesy storyline to it. All right, if you're talking about a pornographic film, regardless of what genre it is, does it display or appeal to a prurient interest? Sexual, lustful, lascivious. Well, if it's a good pornographic film, it probably is. Does it display offensive sexual conduct? Again, it probably will, again, depending upon community standards. Having said this, does it lack literary, artistic, political, or scientific value? No. This is where that cheesy storyline comes in. Because when you think about it, that is the literary value. If you were just nothing but sex in these movies, well, that would lack any of these other things. That would make it obscene. But as soon as you add in that literary, re uh, uh, I guess, reference, no matter how cheesy or how light that storyline is, as long as that storyline is there, it will be protected under the First Amendment because it has some redeeming literary value. That would be a pornographic film. Think about a strip club. How many of you have ever been to a strip club? Or maybe a better question would be how many of you or, your, or, or someone you know has ever been to a strip club? Why do people go? They go there. Does it appeal to a prurient interest? Absolutely it does. They're dancing. Does it display offensive sexual conduct? This is debatable. You could probably make the case that it does. You could certainly probably make the case that it doesn't. But the bottom line is, is that this could meet both of these two. Literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Does a strip club lack this? Well, it's not literary this time. When you think about it, now you're dealing with artistic content because they are dancing. The dance is going to be artistic. When you think about the shakes and the moves and all of these other things, the bottom line is, is that this will make the strip club legal, again, because of this artistic content. Now, in fairness, some areas are, are, are going to, to outlaw these things, or they maybe not necessarily outlaw them, but they will put limits on how much stripping can be done. That's fine. But if somebody just gets up there and takes off their clothes, there's nothing to it. As soon as they begin to dance, it becomes artistic, and that makes it, makes it protectable. Now, there are a couple of other things, and we're talking about obscenity within the context of sexuality, prurient interest, strip clubs, things like this. You could also be obscene in other measures as well. There was an artist who had got public funding from the United States government, federal funding from the United States government to make art. To make art. This is what he did. He got federal money, he went and he got a little plastic container, he urinated in the container, and he hung a crucifix with Jesus on the crucifix in the urine. His art, as he called it, was called Piss Christ. There's obviously a statement that's going to be there. I suspect that the statement would be difficult to say that it would be flattering for Christianity or for Jesus or for the crucifix for that matter. But for our purposes, that's what guy did. Now think about this. He got federal money, he peed into a container, he hung a crucifix in it, and he called it art. Does this appeal to a prurient interest? Sexual, lustful, or lascivious? Well, no, it doesn't. Does this display offensive sexual conduct? Well, no, it doesn't. Does this lack literary, artistic, political, or scientific value? A lot of folks, particularly in the South, would say, this completely lacks any value whatsoever. But having said this, it did not demonstrate the prurient interest. It did not demonstrate offensive sexual conduct. You only need one of these things in order to be able to be protected. And believe it or not, it was legal a number of years back for the federal government to fund this kind of art. So the obscenity test doesn't necessarily have to be sexual. The obscenity test could be something that would just be viewed as inappropriate, in-your-face kind of thing. A um, couple of other things. Child pornography. Believe it or not, child pornography is completely illegal in the United States, save one category. With the exception of one category, child pornography is completely illegal in the United States. Now think about this. You don't necessarily think about child porn as being something that would be under the First Amendment. But pornography is considered expression. In some instances, it could be considered literary or artistic, quite frankly. So when you put this into context, maybe that makes it uh, make a little bit more sense. Some folks might say that's never going to fall within the First Amendment. But nonetheless, for our purposes... It is completely illegal to use children in pornographic situations 
with the exception of if it is a complete cartoon situation. So with this in mind, if you've got children in cartoons, they're not real children. So believe it or not, that's actually something that's going to be protected under the First Amendment. But if you have somebody that is a child, obviously that's completely illegal. If you have somebody that is a grown-up that is digitally remastered to be a child, believe it or not, that is completely illegal, even though, in fact, there are no children involved, because you're socializing people to think in terms of those kinds of activities with children being appropriate, and the court didn't want to go there. Last thing, chocolate. Chocolate. Let's say that you're an artist, and instead of using paint or crayons or markers, you instead decide that you want to make food art. And what you do is you take nice chocolate and you melt it over people's naked bodies. I'm not making this up. Here's my question. Does this appeal to a prurient interest? Well, yes. Yes, it does. Does this display offensive sexual conduct? Maybe. It doesn't have to, but I think you could make the argument that it could. Does this lack literary, artistic, political, or scientific value? Believe it or not, the argument would be this has artistic value and this is perfectly legal. So you can use chocolate or you could use hot sauce or you could use whipped cream or you could use beef stew gravy, whatever it is, food stuff that you wanted and put it over somebody's naked body and make art with it and it would be completely protected under the First Amendment. This would not be considered obscenity. I give you this, the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law. Well, no doesn't always mean no. If it did, we would be able to go out in the hallway of the school and yell fire when there wasn't a fire. If it did, we would be able to have child pornography and that would be 100% perfectly legal. If it did, when you sit down and think about this, we would be able to do any number of things in the, in the sexual realms involving people, children, animals, and we could go on and on and on. No doesn't mean no, and it doesn't mean no in terms of religion, it doesn't mean no in terms of speech, press, petition, or assembly. The government can actually place some restrictions. This obscenity test is one of them, but note on this, you only have to meet one of these three. The one that you typically meet is the third one, and it is protected. And at that point, even if you fail the first two parts, doesn't matter, it would still be protected content under the First Amendment.